Hey guys, what's up? My name is JC. I am Ron Strong and today I'm going to tell you how I survived pretty much making money from the age of 15 to about 16. Let's get into this video. I never heard of it. The Mad Max Mexican. If you're in Mexico during the barrio, cut down that That's when I first heard about him. First heard about him. He was a legend. He used to say he was the biggest Mexican they'd ever seen. El AJC, una historia en el camino. La vida le dio duras lecciones desde niño. Se fue creciendo entre las drogas y las calles. Chicago Gangster, muchas malas amistades. Solo quería ser el dueño de su imperio. Y le costaron muchos viajes hacia México. La vida es chula, compa. Entre cantinas y las viejas con tequila, mucha droga, compa. JC tenía un futuro ya seguro. Con 17 se tornaría muy oscuro. Iba de vuelta con rumbo para USA. Iba cargado, pero lo paró un retén. Y así comienza la otra parte de su vida. Encarcelado por una mala movida. What's up? JC, Wrong Strong. You already know. If you're new to my channel, make sure you subscribe. Hit the bell. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Leave a message. Come on, man. If you're part of my crew, mi raza, mi familia, mi pandilla, you already know. Shaitan's finest. Subanse a la suburban. Let's take a road down western. Maybe ram a couple of people. Nah, I'm just playing. <laughs> Those days are over. Even though I had a lot of fun driving up and down western in my 1977 Silverado extended pickup truck with my pipes and my bumper in the front. It was fun. I ended up losing it to the cops, took it away. Yeah, man. Those were the glory days, warriors. But, you know, I was a lost kid. Lost in the whole gang stuff, you know, brainwashed. And, you know, now my biggest mission is to pull kids from that life and just tell them the truth. That that ain't the way to live. That ain't the way to die. That's not the way to do time. You know? So pretty much as a kid, man, I first started breaking into cars when I was about 14 and I was homeless. So pretty much at night, I had one of my boys that actually taught me how to do it. He was, he was a little bit older than me, but as soon as it would become dark at night, like 12 midnight, one, we would actually go from car to car. And only if there was something like expensive in the car, we would break the window and take the risk of making the noise or the alarm going off. We would use spark plugs. Either, other than that, we would pretty much just check the doors and you would be surprised how many people leave the doors open with stuff inside the car. There was times where we came up on guns, purses, money. I mean, you name it. Like there was times that we didn't get nothing and there was times that we came up big time. Then I got a little bit older and I started hanging out with, you know, I guess you could say bigger criminals that knew more stuff and I started stealing cars. I actually got taught by uh, this guy, uh, I won't say his name. <laughs> Anyways, carrying a big screwdriver all the time on me, it's really, really easy to steal cars that are built between the 70s and I guess all the way into the 80s because all you do is put the neck down all the way and you stick the screwdriver in and you start breaking the whole neck of the car all the way to where the key goes and once you get there you break the little moon off and that's it the car just turns on you'd be surprised how easy it is yeah so i started stealing like the sabers you know um park avenues so i started stealing the cars and i started retagging them Retagging them means that I would go to the junkyard, get a clean title of a car that was totaled pretty much, you know, Park Avenue 81 or 78 or whatever, but it matched the car that I was stealing and I would change all the VIN numbers with a simple rivet gun, 
you know, some of the ribbons had like GM on it and stuff like that. It was easy to kind of like work around that where you could make it look good and glue it on there. It had to be really, really, you had to be very, very uh, particular and like detail. You had to like make it really work because if not, when the cops pulled you over, they started checking all the VIN numbers. And if you don't know, VIN numbers are everywhere. They're in the front of the car, they're in the doors, they're in the car seats, they're in the seat, they're in the hood. They are everywhere. So I would actually take the time and change everything I could in the car. You know, back then, the Chevy Caprices were really big. Pillow seats, captain seats. In the captain seat, it had so much pillow that you could actually open up the zipper and hide a gun in there and cruise around with it. We're talking about the old days. And this is why, you know, um, my channel, I share my, my stories. I call it being selfish, where I share my personal stories because I feel that there was a million JCs out there, a million, you know, uh, uh, models, a million, all these guys that I hung around with on the streets doing the same shit that I was doing. You know, some of us were lucky enough to make it out, some of us weren't. And that's the thing, man, that we are luck. the ones that made it out, we are lucky to actually be out because there's a lot of us that are doing time and never coming home and there's a lot of us that got killed in the process. You know what I mean? But that's what I would do, I would you know, change all the VIN numbers on the car, on the, on the seats, everything. And then I would turn around and sell it for, you know, a reasonable amount. So it would go fast because people would come and see the car. It would be in a really good condition. And, you know, they would take it. So I would always go kind of steal the cars from like Berwyn. The nice areas where I could find really nice, really, really nice, like Chevy Caprices, Park Avenues. If you knew me back in the day, I used to drive around 59th Street in a Chevy Caprice 85 Broham uh, pillow seats. I had a chameleon paint job and I would always have my two pit bulls in there with me. <laughs> yeah, you know, before that I had a van and I had a pickup truck. But, you know, I was young. I was trying to make money. I was trying to survive. That's how it was for me. It was easy. Um, stealing came, I guess, as a, I wouldn't say as a second nature. I, I would say it was more for survival because I, I didn't have nothing, nobody. And the dudes that were older on my block always kept me hungry. You know, I did a lot of dirty work for them. They lived good. They had nice cars. They had all this shit, but I always, always was starving i always was hungry i was always on the streets so it was a little bit different for me you know but i had to do what i had to do to survive shout out to malo 59 i know you watch my videos dog i'm happy and i'm proud of you that you changed your life and that you're doing what you're doing taking care of your family working a nine to five and just you know left that gang banging shit behind and you know that's what it's all about man growth it's not just about when I see those old guys that are still there, it, it kind of like breaks my heart because like, how long can you do that for? Like, what, when do you say enough is enough and you grow up and you stop lying to these kids that are just getting killed left and right, man? You know, one of my biggest goals and missions one day is to come back to Chicago and actually work, whether it's in the youth center or, or, or the, the county jail, but actually, work and get get some real work done and teach these kids man that that's not that's not the way to go i get it chicago's a gangster -ass city i get it like it's embedded in our culture you grow up on the street and it's it doesn't matter what race you are it doesn't matter what color or nothing you grow up on that street and that's what you are and you actually get beat up for living on that street when you're not nothing i get it and then what happens they kind of push you into being something because you're always getting beat up anyways. That's how most of the gangs in Chicago have started. That's how most of the gangs have, you know, grown in Chicago because people come together and they get tired of getting bullied. And, you know, they come together, they, they created a gang, and then they start fighting them too. But you have to admit that it has gotten out of hand and all these kids are dying, getting life sentences for what? 
for nothing. For nothing. You're fighting for a block that's not yours. You're fighting for colors that are not yours. And at the end of the day, you know what? You know what's sad? At the end of the day, when you go through that time, you actually start to become better, better friends with some of your enemies. That's how it was for me. When I went in, Cadillac Joe looked out for me when none of the SDs, none of the folks gave me shit. And this Land King was giving me coffee every day, teaching me the ropes, and kind of guiding me. You know, I don't, I'm not here to disrespect no organization at all. I have love for every organization in Chicago. This is why I do my, my gang life episodes because it's history and I get it. It's, it's been embedded in our culture, Humble Park, Southside, like all these, all these gangs that go way back to the like 70s, you know, the Vikings, the 12th Street Players, all these gangs, man, have a piece of Chicago, a piece of history. But we could turn it all around and actually become something better. And that means guiding our, our kids and our youth to a better future, man. You don't have to be a tough guy. You don't have to kill somebody. You don't have to murder somebody for the colors or the jackets. I get it, there's bad blood because this person killed that person and now you're feeling it. I get it, man. My best friend died, died in my arms. I watched him take his last breath. I get it. And not just one, multiple times. I get it. I get it. That, that is Chicago. Chicago's been like that since the Capone days. It's been like that. But it's gonna take real motherfuckers to see that and put in some work. Because to be a true leader, you have to be a follower. And at the end of the day, man, all the families are crying. The dude doing the time, the dude that life got taken away, everybody's crying and nobody wins. All we're doing is killing our own raza. That's all we're doing for what? For nothing. I remember as a kid, there were certain streets we wouldn't even drive past because we already knew we couldn't because we would probably get beat up by other kids. There were certain schools we didn't go play to. And that's bullshit, man. Kids should not live their life like that. They should not be like that. You should be a kid. You should be able to play and go anywhere you want in any part. I know it's going to take time and it probably sounds like an impossible mission. But guarantee this, that one day I will open a Wrong to Strong facility in Chicago where it's going to be like a boys and girls club and I will have a halfway house there and I will do the work to try and fix what I helped damage in the 90s and early 2000s because that's what it takes. My name's JC. I am Wrong to Strong. Hey, don't judge nobody. Stay in your lane. Live savage and remember... We only have one life to live, but if you live it right and you stay out of jail, it's going to be a good life. My next episode I'm going to do on gang life is going to be the MODs, the Maniac Land Disciples. Yeah, they used to always do it really cool like this. <laughs> I'll check you guys on the rebound.